to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Dr. Craig Conover, my man. How are you, brother? I'm good, Aubrey. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, good to hear your voice as well. These are interesting times. You haven't been able to see your patients. Well, <clears throat> we're still open. Uh, we've certainly slowed down, um, but we're still, we're still running IVs every day. We're still trying to see as many people as we can. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a strange, strange time for sure. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, I guess all medical facilities are considered essential businesses. So, um, of course, you're open. I just <laughs> I'm just used to the rest of the world where we have to shut everything down. I know. Um, but, uh, I know. but yeah, it's it's good that you can still support people because, you know, one of the things that I think we all have backwards is that we go to our doctors or we start worrying about our health at the point where our health is in significant crisis. You know, right. rather than trying to work on our health while we're healthy. And I think that's one of the areas where, you know, you've put so much of your focus. And um, one of the reasons why I've chosen you as, you know, my preferred doctor um, is just that how much you emphasize health while you're healthy. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I think this whole, uh, the last couple months for sure, I think, you know, coming out of this for a lot of people will be this focus on, you know, how can I focus on my own health now to help me prepare for later. Um, and I think one of the things we're seeing with these crazy times is a lot of people haven't, you know, given it that much energy, that much their resources. So I'm hopeful coming out of this that um, we're really going to see an uptick in people really paying attention to their health in the ways that, you know, you've been promoting, I've prom been promoting um, for a long time. So we'll see. Yeah. And, you know, look, the, the data is really showing us that. I mean, people respond to inspiration or desperation. And I think, you know, as you look at this virus and if you look at any virus, like any other kind of um, comorbid conditions is increasing like a massive rate of fatality and struggle. Right. Like when it's when any new virus is initiated into a unhealthy body, you know, the strain and the available resources that body has to fight whatever it is. We're not just talking about, you know, the coronavirus. We're talking about any condition, but this is just the one that's on everybody's mind. But, you know, it's really showing with incredibly strong evidence that, you know, if you're healthy, you're going to respond, you know, by the data so much better to this situation than if you're not healthy. So the impetus is on us to remain healthy, not only for our current health, but if there is kind of a macro strain um, on the immune system that's happening on a global level, which we're now aware of as possible, then the most important thing you can do is to really buffer your own internal resources. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's well said. And I think, you know, the way I think about it, or at least thinking about the last couple of months is, you know, this is just one virus, but we're constantly exposed to different threats, so to speak. And those threats come in many different forms. This is obviously an infectious threat, um, but you know, I think what one thing that this is showing us, this whole series of events, is that those threats come from in many different forms, right? So, it, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of people, it's physical, but well beyond that, which I'm sure we'll get into, is the whole mental aspect, the whole emotional and spiritual aspect of how do you take care of yourself, which will then trickle down to physically, you know, boosting your immune system. Yeah, that's huge. And I think that's one of the most underlooked things. I was doing a little bit of research um, before this call. And, you know, obviously, one of my favorite books is uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's You Are the Placebo, where he goes through, you know, hundreds of clinical trials that talk about the placebo effect. And then also, it's evil twin, the nocebo effect, 
right? Which is the same thing. Basically, the placebo effect is when someone gives you the impression that you're going to get well based upon some course of action, right? I mean, that's the classic placebo. And and that's accounted for in every clinical trial. But some clinical trials have tested that specifically. So there's, you know, like thousands and thousands of those trials that have been that have been analyzed. And then there's but there's less that have studied the nocebo effect. But I found one that talks about um, 151 publications, 20 of which were empirical studies, and they were really actually studying the nocebo effect. And the conclusion that was drawn, and I'll just read it here, and in the show notes, um, in the show notes, I'll talk about it. Um, let me just get to the, uh, get to the, get to the um, statement here. So this is from Bernard Laun. And he says, words are the most powerful tool a doctor possesses, but words like a two-edged sword can maim as well as heal. And I thought that was just like an incredibly powerful statement after analyzing the metadata from all of these clinical trials for both placebo and nocebo and saying like, okay, doctors and medical professionals and other people, friends, like be mindful of the words you have because doctors have a ton of tools. Let me, let me read that again. Words are the most powerful tool a doctor possesses, but words like a two edged sword can maim as well as heal. Mm. Like I think that as a society and as a medical profession, and I'd love you to weigh in on this, people are very somewhat careless with the power that words have on the human body. Yeah. I think that was really well said. Yeah, I think if you just if we if we even step outside of the whole corona issue and we look <clears throat> just at how doctors for the most part and this is a huge generalization but I think it's it's true. You know, doctors and I, and I don't think they're doing it um out of any sort of agenda beyond that's how they're trained and that's how they enter into the patient visit and in, in medicine itself. Doctors motivate patients through fear and that, you know, is you could look at cancer care, you could look at, you know, diabetes, heart disease, um, neurodegenerative care. Most of it starts with the doctor, you know, telling the patient, if you don't do this, and by the way, this is, there's only a set limited number of options because most doctors don't believe in anything but the prescriptions or the surgery they prescribe. But if you don't do these things that I recommend, really bad things are going to happen to you. Right. and, And that fear... Um, like we're experiencing now with Corona, which is ever present, it is really um, so powerful. And that fear literally trickles down and creates a, a you know negative immune response, a negative stress response, all of these things we can dive into. And that's where it starts. I always think of, you know, in terms of placebo, they've studied, you know, just simply the patient's view or how they feel about the surgeon that is operating on them has an impact on the outcome of the surgery. So mm-hmm. if you have a positive you know, feeling about the surgeon who's operating on you, you're gonna have a better outcome. Yeah, I mean, like what you, don't wanna, what you don't wanna hear is, oh, are you the best surgeon in the hospital? <laughs> uh, no, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express <laughs> last night. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, like that. Or like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm just a, an intern and I, I, this is my first one, so let's see how it goes. Sure. <laughs> you know, like, oh. that's, the, that's the last thing you want if you're getting a spinal fusion or, you know, some kind of other big surgery because that's going to put that absolute fear and stress into your body and you're going to have doubt as to the efficacy of, um, efficacy of the treatment. Or, or even taking a step further, you know, that surgeon, you know, pretty much downplaying or, or talking down to the patient leading up to the surgery, not seeing the patient as a whole person, that's also going to play negatively <clears throat> into that surgery because it's it's going to play into how the patient sees themselves um, in that scenario. Yeah. Yeah. They talked about all of the ways that the nocebo in this uh, clinical trial, again, that, that I'm referencing, it's on PubMed and I'm referencing in the, in the show notes. Um, they talk about some of the main ways. So causing uncertainty is one way that the nocebo, when they say this medication may help, or let's try this drug, you know, like those are, that's like causing uncertainty, like, well, I don't know, but you know, we'll give it a go. You know sure. what I mean? Then it causes uncertainty. And then there's you know, jargon, like the way that they're, um, that the way that they're talking about it. So they studied when, uh, some doctors were saying, 
when they were attaching an oxygen mask, they would sometimes say, just colloquially, now we're hooking you up to an artificial nose. And like mm. people are like, what? What the fuck does that mean? You right. know? So like the jargon itself can be an issue. Uh, and then they talk about ambiguity, um, where you know if you're going into, under anesthesia and they say, so we're going to put you to sleep now and it'll soon be all over. You know, and they're like, what the fuck does that mean? You know, right. so like that ambiguity creates that uncertainty. And then emphasizing the negative, which I think is <clears throat> one of the things that I think really we're seeing in this situation is a huge issue with the nocebo effect that I think is being propagated, you know, worldwide at this point. It's even saying something like, you are a high risk patient, like that simple thing of like, you are a high risk patient, or that always hurts a lot, or, you know, that emphasizing of the negative, focusing attention, you know, like, are you feeling not, are you feeling nauseous, you know, like, or focusing on what, what they're experiencing, like, yes, you want the information, and you want the feedback, but it's also going to focus the attention on the negative effects, sure. like, if you're like, are you having trouble breathing, can you breathe, you know, and they're like, I don't know, can I breathe, shit, <laughs> right. I don't know if I can breathe, you know what I mean, sure, um, and then, like, and then they also say ineffective negation and trivialization, which is the opposite, which is just kind of this blase. Uh, they they quote, "You don't need you don't need to worry. Ah, it's just going to bleed a little bit." You know, mm. like when when someone knows that that's not true and it's not it's an ineffective negation and trivialization where they realize that that's not accurate. That's also going to cause that same uncertainty and doubt. And I think we're seeing this played out where everybody is highlighting how this thing is you know the the reaper of death and it's coming for us all you know it's putting people into this really intense fear state and i think the governmental agencies while meaning well wanting people to maintain social distances wanting people to do their best to as they say flatten the curve nonetheless they're also creating a massive global nocebo effect which is undoubtedly based on the clinical research on the nocebo effect causing an effect on how people respond to this virus. Oh, yeah. And I think it's, you know, I, I taking it somewhat for, from a different angle, but, you know, I often talk to my patients about, you know, and this is a very, you know, it's a truism, you know, whatever you focus on in your life is what you get. And, and we're seeing this play out as, as we focus on negative things, like you're saying, you're going to get more negativity, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if you focus on positive things, you're going to get more positivity that the easiest example I use with patients is, you know, weight loss, <clears throat> because that's such a common issue for people wanting to lose weight. And, and when people have that narrative in their, their head over and over, Oh, I can't wait to lose weight. You know, I'm excited to lose weight. You're still focused on the weight. Uh, you know, a better way to take that would be, I can't wait to wear that bathing suit or I can't, can't yeah. wait to wear that shirt where you lead it somewhere and you're, mm -hmm. you're pushing it towards the positive. And yeah, just like you're saying with the whole Corona thing, there's a lot of uncertainty now, but that uncertainty doesn't mean, you know, I think people confuse uncertainty with a bad outcome, right? That uncertainty can also be turned into curiosity, which is a better way to frame positivity, right? Like yeah. I'm curious as to what's going to come out from all of this is a right. very different approach as to, oh, wow, the world is ending. You know, if you don't do these things, um, we're all going to die. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And it, that's, you know, when you come in with that attitude, um, it's going to cause, you know, look, I've had a panic attack before, you know, like I've had a panic attack where I thought I took a tainted, so I thought this was in high school and I went to practice and I took a new supplement, like one of those shitty GNC supplements and right. it had an effect It caused like some heart palpitations as, you know, cause a lot of these things when back in the days we're talking like, 1997 i think this was right so in 97 yeah. my knowledge of supplements was limited and of course you just go to gnc and you get something and it's in a shiny you know a shiny foil label and it has a rhino on it and it says like beast mode triple x i was yeah. like sure i'll That's fucking it. i'll, I'll yeah. take a scoop of beast mode triple x <laughs> you know and then i took beast mode triple x and my fucking heart started like palpitating which is normal like heart palpitations happen but for me it, it hadn't happened before or my heart was like skipping beats and like, and I went into a full panic attack. I laid down, I laid down on the ground in the parking lot after practice and was like, and I had to call an ambulance. Wow. You know, I was like, I need help. I need help. Sure. You know, where, because I like the fear that I took something that was poison, you know, and not having somebody to be like, 
oh yeah, Rhino Triple X. It had 400 milligrams of caffeine <laughs> and some ephedrine in it. And you know, like <laughs> that's a normal response. Yeah. That's a normal response. That yeah. I would have probably just been like, oh. Okay. And, and, you know, eventually I got to that place where like, okay, I'm going to be all right. You yeah. know, like, but it, it took me to the point where I had to, it exacerbated the symptoms to such a grandiose degree that I literally had to take an ambulance ride. That's great. Well, and, and it pinpoints just how you frame things, because if you had known that and felt your heart beating that fast and you said, this is good, <clears throat> you would have gone and crushed a workout. Right. Right. And you'd been like, this is awesome. I'm Superman. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. It would have been a, just a, a whole different framework. Or I would have been like, well, this is probably a little much. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I won't take Rhino Triple X, but <laughs> right. nonetheless, I I see what it's uh I see what it's, you know, trying to do here. Yeah. Um and and you just kind of have a different idea. I mean, you see that in psychedelic medicine all the time as well, which is why it's so important that, you know, people don't have the fear that and that they have to have trust in the shaman and trust in the provider and trust in the medicine. Because the moment you believe that you took something that you're not supposed to take or at a dose that you're not supposed to take, like just watching people's fear response go out of control and they'll have like full mental breaks, sure. which I've witnessed and talking to the people who've run, you know, like the Zendo, uh, the Zendo project, which is provided by maps and goes to festivals to handle people having hard psychedelic experiences. Like they are masters of their language so that they're not trying to exacerbate these kind of anxious panic attacks, which can, which can create real trauma from these experiences um, by just kind of really normalizing and having that calm and and kind of loving um, response. Like, no, it's going to be all right, you know. Yeah. And, and even myself, you know, people know that I've done a lot of psychedelics. I'll get calls sometimes late at night from people who normally wouldn't call me, and I'll answer because it'll it'll be aberrant. And I'll be like, hey, what's up? And they're like, yo, I took the mushrooms and I think fucking everybody's trying to kill me, bro. And like, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. This is, this is bad. Like the, uni- like the universe is going to... And I'm like, oh, okay, 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 okay. What you're experiencing is called the normal. Right. Like, this is the normal, this is the normal freak out that happens under these conditions. And then when, as soon as I say that, they're like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah, man. It's like, it's all good. Like, this is the normal. Like, nobody's sure. trying to kill you. Nobody's out to get you. Like, you're fine. Well, and I think but that that ties it back to what you originally said about doctors using the right language and doctors are just not trained to use the right language. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're trained to, um, for the most part, again, a big generalization, but this is most doctors is patients will come in with a complaint and the doctor's thinking of the three medicines they could prescribe or the surgery that's next. And by no means are they validating what the patient feels or helping the patient experience for what they're feeling. I mean, it's just... Yeah. It's it's terrible. Well, and you, I mean, you went through medical school and did the full thing, you know, and and I mean, you know firsthand how little training that you got in that. I mean, and if this if this citation is accurate, that words are the most powerful tool that a doctor has in his in his arsenal, right? Like that quote that I read, then there should be a significant amount of training that goes on for doctors to use the right language, like use these tools in a productive rather than a, you know, deleterious way. Yeah. Well, I I mean, uh, it's been a while since I've been in medical school, so I have no idea. My, my hunch is that's, that's not happening, won't happen anytime soon. And, and mostly I think it's because, and and maybe we're going to see some changes coming out of this Corona stuff, but I mean, most people see their doctor as um, just there to help, you know, with a disease state, only needed now and then, and they're not really seeking the doctor for any sense of wellness or well-being, you know, so that, so the doctors don't step into that role, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're there to, you know, for life-saving things when people are really sick. Um, but as we know, most, most things nowadays are not life or death. So, so that role for the doctor has, has changed a lot, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, I think the name that you use for your practice of medicine is you know performance medicine and you're really looking at this more holistic approach of addressing not just the symptom but addressing the totality of the root cause and i think that's you know it seems like the way that medicine has to transition um you know and maybe this whole experience will highlight that 
Um, but you know, ultimately, there's many things that are pointing to this, including the clinical research. Um, but you know, people really starting to look at, all right, let's not just let's not just try and block the signals that are coming to the body. Like maybe these signals are there for a reason. You know, like oh, you're feeling depressed, right? Well, maybe they're there for a reason because there's something unaddressed emotionally or some trauma that you haven't dealt with. Or let's not block the signal. Maybe you need to block the signal for a little while to give you the space to be able to start to maneuver, but it can't be the only thing you do. Right. You know what I mean? You can't just take a cortisone shot every single day in your knee if your knee is fucked up and not listen to the signal of what's going on in your knee. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the tide is turning a bit. I mean, I've certainly noticed um, with prospective patients, people asking me questions and certainly listening to patients about their frustrations, you know, seeing other doctors, um, so I, I think the tide is turning in terms of people wanting more than just someone to manage medicine for them, you know, write prescriptions, give them shots, um, do surgery. I think people are becoming, you know, disgruntled with, with how mainstream medicine is being practiced and they want more for themselves. And, and part of that comes from, you know, understanding consciousness, understanding that they're, they're a whole being and they're not just made up of different organ systems. Right. Because yep. I think that's how mainstream medicine approaches it. You know, you see the cardiologist for your heart. Um, you'll see the neurologist for your brain. And but that's not how it works. I mean, we're not individual components. So I'm hopeful and I'm hopeful coming out of, you know, this kind of big pause we've all had is that people I mean, it seems that people are understanding, hey, I, there's an opportunity at least for me to do better for myself so that when the next threat comes, because there will always be a threat, I don't have to be as worried and scared um, and, and nervous about how I'm going to handle it. Yeah. So what have you seen? Give a snapshot of any shifts that you've seen, um, positive or negative, in the way that people have been responding during this time. Because obviously I'm sure you're getting lots of calls and um, you know, there's a lot of people reaching out to you. Yeah. At this time and you're still seeing people. So what's, you know, what are some, what are some ways in which you think people have responded positively and some ways that you think people are responding in less than optimal ways? I've seen a lot of frustration from people, um, feeling like they're helpless, you know, feeling like, you know, for example, um, you know, most people like to dedicate some time to exercise and, and nowadays that is, you know, they're going to a gym. Well, when the gyms get shut down, um, people really are frustrated that they can't move, that they can't work out, that they can't exercise. Um, they feel like that's being taken from them, um, which I understand. It's just a shift in, you know, again, how are how is all of us, how are all of us going to better take care of ourselves? What responsibility are we going to take for ourselves to, you know, better our health or, you know, boost our immune system? Um, so there's a lot of frustration, but I think that frustration, that, you know, is then turning into uh, more hope that, you know, I need to rethink, you know, how I approach every day of my life. Because there seems to be before the whole corona thing, I mean, I'm just, again, a generalization, but there's this attitude that, you know, health is given to people, right? And it's it's not something that people really have to seek out. Um, I mean, a lot of my patients certainly you know, take that on. They're, they're very deliberate about how they work out, you know, eating right for themselves, taking supplements, working on their health on a regular basis. Um, but there's, you know, there's just plenty more who, for better or for worse, just think or have the notion that it should be given to them um, and that they don't have to seek it out. And I think that tide is turning. Like, I think mm -hmm. um, those, those complaints I was seeing six, eight weeks ago about the frustrations are, are turning more into, wow, this is an opportunity to really seek out what's best for me. Um, a lot of people have been really thankful that, you know, we're able to offer them different therapies that they can't get from, you know, mainstream medicine, different IVs, peptides, supplements, hormones, um, all of those things, which are very safe, by the way, and, and work very well. Um, people are really thankful that there's options because I think that's one of the things that's going to come out of this is, you know, we need lots more options than we've been told, right? And that yeah. they exist, but they've been really hard to find. Um, and, and one thing I enjoy doing with patients is really providing those options. 
because mm. I don't think it's fair for anyone not to have all of the options on the table. We all deserve yeah. that, you know? Agreed. Agreed. You know, the other thing that, um, you know, and those of you who listen to my podcast with uh, Travis Christofferson, who, or my talk that I gave with him, he recently published in uh, 2019, published a book called Curable. And in that book, um, it was a follow up. He did a great job in this book called Tripping Over the Truth, The Metabolic yep. Theory of Cancer. But in Curable, you know, one of the big points that he makes, and he's a medical researcher, is pouring through the literature on, and, and I talk about this a little bit in my book on the day as well, but he does, does a more extensive job. You know, the greatest predictor of early mortality and early death is the perception mm. of loneliness. That is the number one predictor, like above obesity, above any other different lifestyle change. And he studies centena- from centenarians to the, you know, kind of the macro population studies to everything. It's the perception of loneliness. And I think one of the things that this quarantine isolation has done is it's actually exacerbated loneliness but i think people are finding ways digital ways to communicate with each other and and kind of open up so i don't think it necessarily requires physical contact but it certainly is an element but one of the things that we got to realize like if loneliness is the number one predictor of early mortality as the research shows and again i encourage you to, to look at all the clinical citations in the in the book curable by travis christopherson um we have to be mindful that we don't get ourselves into an isolated state where we're afraid of every other right. human being like that that is going to be a recipe for absolute disaster and when i see something like when the when the la mayor was offering rewards for people to rat each other out if they're you know violating social distancing policies or having you know having people over at their house like there's no other way that you're going to feel more lonely than if you feel like your neighbors are snitches and that they are everybody who's a stranger that you don't know is against you. Like that's going to make you feel really fucking lonely rather than bringing this community together. It's going to do the opposite. And I think they're unwittingly based on their own fear, creating outcomes that are going to have massive, massive negative societal effects, perhaps greater than any kind of other implications like sure let's take the responsible measures you know to slow the spread of this virus i'm all about that but we cannot turn people against people because that is the most supportive thing for yeah no i totally agree i mean we are we are social creatures and it is through i mean for most of us we find meaning in life through the relationships we have so once you divide isolate, insulate against relationships, then that's probably the worst thing as a society we can do. Like literally the worst thing. Because mm-hmm. um, I think the stat that I read, you know, speaking to the isolation, I think it increases your chance of mortality by 45%. So that's massive, like massive. It's staggering. And uh, yeah, and so... You know, it's just, it's, it's a little unnerving and, and thinking about, okay, when we come out of this, um, you know, how are we going to respond? I'm hopeful people will be able to jump back in. Um, and, And one thing that they, you know, maybe, maybe there's some good that we took for granted, the relationships we had, you know, we, we certainly have been promoting it with cell phones and social media, right? Like people feel way more comfortable messaging on a phone than having a regular conversation with a human. So, you know, I think one good thing is it's going to highlight that is how much we miss that and and how, you know, we need to get mm-hmm. gather and commune together, like you're saying, like it's such a powerful tool, but it's it's human nature. Like we're hardwired to to be with other humans. Like we absolutely need it. And mm-hmm. and it like you're you're alluding to it's it is the best medicine. So, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I, I think it's it's being mindful of that. And I think there's some great content. You know, there was a, a beautiful poem put out by Prince EA. Um, I saw an amazing uh, I saw an amazing piece um, by somebody who took ayahuasca. And and then the the title of the piece He's actually speaking in Spanish and it's translated. But he says um, the title is, you know, I am responsible for mm. COVID-19. And you look at that and you're like, what do you, what do you mean? And what he basically was shown through the medicine was that 
really the virus that that we're talking about here is so entwined and interconnected with the Mm -hmm. virus of fear you know and he found the fear in his own heart and in his own psyche and in finding that fear he was recognizing like all right yes he didn't cause the virus the west you know we know the wet markets in china was probably the origin source of that virus but really the the virus that is affecting everybody that almost everybody is infected by right now is the virus of fear and that fear is going to have all kinds of those you know you can just look at the fight or flight response like what that does to the immune system i mean you can probably i'm sure speak to that greater than me but when you're in a state of fear you know what happens to the yeah. human immune system no yeah well and i'll talk about that i think the the greatest fear though for people is death and um and, you know for better or for worse it, it is a part of life and you know and going back to some of this even with the you know you have some you know people in the biohacking community who promote that we're going to live forever and I just don't think that's the way it should be, right? We're, we're not here to live forever, right? And I think beyond living gracefully, most of us want to die gracefully. And um, being able to understand that, and appreciate that, you know, how you can die gracefully and owning it and accepting it, that will change how you live your life, you know, and removing that part of the fear. Because mm-hmm. I think for most people, that's probably one of their top fears is dying or at least dying alone. Um but having some peace and acceptance mm. on that, I think, is huge. And I think, yeah, I think there's some good coming out of this whole uh, corona thing that is giving people a chance to pause and understand that this life is really precious and um, we need we can do better and, and not have to, you know, live by this fear. You know, because there is, you know, a lot of people have talked about this, that the actual virus is the fear, right? Um and then addressing yeah. certainly how it affects our immune system. Yeah, I mean, you know, going back to your comment where you where you took that supplement, you felt your heart racing, um, and then that triggered a panic attack, panic attack. Well, what happens to us when we whenever we perceive a stress um, in in our life <clears throat> is that we we put out, and I think most people are familiar with this. We put out cortisol; it's our stress hormone. It's the firefighter helps us fight Mm -hmm. inflammation. It it literally helps us save our life. Well, at the same time that we put out cortisol, we also put out norepinephrine. They kind of go hand in hand. Norepinephrine is, it's a neurotransmitter. Um, Some people would call it a neurohormone. And what uh, norepinephrine does is it increases our heart rate, increases our blood pressure. Well, what we know from people who kind of have a chronic stress they actually deplete their ability to put out cortisol. <clears throat> and so when you have a perceived stress and you can't put out as much cortisol as you need to, you basically will have unopposed norepinephrine. Well, unopposed norepinephrine causes your heart rate to increase, your blood pressure increase, and that feels like anxiety. And so just that alone from mm-hmm. chronically chipping away at your kind of stress hormone system leads people to have more anxiety on a very biochemical basis, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And that, you know, down regulates the immune system. I mean, it's basically signaling to your body, like we have an immediate threat. And in that immediate threat, we need to shuttle all available resources towards survival. And that means you need to run, you need to fight, you need to do something. And in that short term condition, it's very positive. The body has that intelligence, but in the chronic state, that's when you're chronically depleting the immune system. You know, you're you're chronically downregulating your natural ability to prioritize your immune response and instead trying to focus on an immediate threat. Well, if we're living in that state perpetually, you know, then we're never going to give our body time to actually do what it's designed to do, which is go to that place of rest and peace and tranquility and equanimity that's going to actually allow us to be in that parasympathetic, nourishing, restorative state that's going to support our immune system. Yeah, and, and, and it's really true, and it's, and it's well said how you, how you said it. And we do a lot of you know, hormone testing, cortisol testing, and it's, it's rare to find an adult with a, an adaptive cortisol response, meaning um, 
you know, cortisol is like the sun. Um, we secrete it throughout the day, but it should be highest in the morning and lowest at night. It's, it's rare to have an adult, you know, follow that rhythm. Most people have, you know, chipped away at their cortisol so they don't put out as much in the morning. And, and I think what people fail to understand is <clears throat> when you lose that cortisol reserve, again, you can adapt to that and you can adapt to that over decades. So your life may not be that much different. You know, you feel like you handle stress okay. But when you're faced with a real stressor like we are now, death of a loved one, loss of a job, and you don't have that reserve, um, this is where big problems you know, come in. Big problems like autoimmune disease, big problems like cancer, a heart, you know, a heart attack, mental breakdown. And all of that comes from, or maybe not all of it, but a lot of it comes from your inability to maintain a healthy cortisol response. So mm-hmm. it directly affects your immune system. And I mean directly. Yeah. And it happens over time. And I think for a lot of people, we've gotten complacent, right? We've gotten complacent with our health and say, everything's good. You know, I, I can handle these stressors and this and that. But it what, what I've witnessed and observed is it catches up with people, usually by the, the fourth or fifth decade, you know, yeah. it catches up to people. They start feeling poorly. They start getting, you know, worried about their health because they don't feel good. Um, and then they go see their doctor and most doctors don't believe this. Most doctors would say, oh, you need an antidepressant or yeah. you need to exercise more or just generic advice, which doesn't help. But, you know, to tell to tell your listeners, there's always lots of options and lots of different, you know, and healthy ways to think about these problems. Yeah. What are, you know, if you, some, if you see someone with a maladaptive cortisol response, someone who's been under kind of chronic stress, you know, what is your, what is your strategy to addressing that with a patient? Um, you test it and their cortisol responses are all over the charts and they come to you and they're like, all right, I need some guidance. I need some help. You know, what do I need to do here? So, the, the first thing, the conversation I have with them is, you know, behavioral changes. So most people um, don't engage in any sort of contemplative exercise. Contemplative exercise for me are things like prayer, <clears throat> meditation, journaling, something where they're introspective, um, they're by themselves, they're not seeking stimulus from an external source, um, because that's very bolstering, right? As you talked about the parasympathetic nervous system, when we are able to be introspective and focus inward, we're really turning on that parasympathetic side of our nervous system. It seems for most people, the sympathetic side, <clears throat> which is foot on the gas, um, comes from external things. And for a lot of people, it even can be just seeking external validation. But um, so, the, so the first thing is we need to help shift that mindset. And practically, people can do that by engaging in some sort of contemplative exercise. And I think the key is they have to be deliberate about it, right? I think as opposed to saying, oh, you know, I'll meditate when I get home if I have time, it's you have to set up time. And it it doesn't have to be meditation. It doesn't have to be prayer. You just have to do something where you can really go inside of yourself, turn off the outside outside world, excuse me. So that's number Mm -hmm. one. Um, Number two, we want to then, for example, we want to support them where they're needed. So if we find that their cortisol is low in the morning, and that's usually the most common, we want to give them or give them options to take things that have a good track record of nurturing their adrenal gland. So people are familiar with uh, the different adaptogenic herbs, which are things like schizandra berry, cordyceps, rhodiola, um, ginseng. There's a whole host of them, licorice root. Um, in combination with certain nutrients like ashwagandha as well, right? Ashwagandha is a great one. Um, uh, and then, and then certain nutrients have a really good effect on the adrenal gland, like vitamin B5 and vitamin A are super important for the health of the adrenal gland. And then vitamin A is, is drastically overlooked. I think, you know, especially talking to you and also, you know, Dr. Dan Engel, I mean, both yep. of you guys are very, and I think he may have actually even picked this up from you. Yeah. Um, cause you've been a big proponent of higher dose vitamin A for specific, uh, specific challenges. What, what kind of brought you into that awareness about vitamin A, which is really kind of not talked about that often. I, you know, I don't, I don't recall like the exact source. Um, but I, I, I know I heard at some point, Uh, a lecture given by actually a naturopathic physician who talked about, you know, the role of vitamin A 
um, not only for our immune system, but for so many systems uh, for, for our health. And, and from there, just studying it. And then what I like to do is first try it on myself, then try it on my friends and family, and then extend it to patients and seeing how well it works. Um, number one, in the, in the setting of an acute illness, people can use you know humongous doses of vitamin A, for example, 300,000 international units a day for a couple of days. Um, that completely turns around a a cold or upper respiratory viral infection, I and mean, people are surprised at it. Um, and then using larger doses of vitamin A, just in general, thing um, sources such as cod liver oil is a great source. Um, it's super, super important for not only hormonal receptors um, having the support of vitamin A, but I think there's some role for vitamin A, obviously as an antioxidant, but even in the brain and helping with signaling. Um, I think mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, we'll say that vitamin A is the workhorse of our immune system, as opposed to I know vitamin D gets all the press, but I really think it comes down to vitamin A and having, you know, really good, stable uh, vitamin A reserves. And and a lot of people can do that through food for sure. Um, but if you want to be, you know, take it to an, the next level and really ensure. Um, I like cod liver oil. Is it's just a great source of vitamin A. I think people does are krill, familiar- does krill oil have the have similar levels of uh, of vitamin A, or is cod it liver doesn't. kind of specific? It doesn't. Yeah, I mean cod liver. Now it's you know krill oil has some good uh, omega three levels. Yeah, EPA um, to DHA ratio is really favorable there. It is good, um, and I think krill is a really good. You know what I like people to do with with the fatty acids, omega threes. You know you know, rotate them. So take fish oil for a few months, then go to krill oil for a few months and go to flaxseed oil, just so you rotate it up. You don't expose yourself to the same substance per se, but, right. but cod liver oil really is, is a great source of vitamin A and D. And I think people are familiar with their, maybe their grandparents or their great grandparents used to tell them, you know, Hey, make sure you take your cod liver oil. Well, I think mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's one of those traditional therapies, which has fallen out of favor, but is a really significant one. Yeah. What about, so you talked about lifestyle, you talked about some of the natural remedies. What about when a medical intervention is necessary, either through hormone therapy or some other kind of, um, you know, stronger, uh, stronger remediation of maladaptive cortisol response? Yeah. So again, if we do testing and we find a patient you know, they have low cortisol in the morning, for example. Well, if it's really low, sometimes they, they need cortisol itself. So we'll give them that in the form of hydrocortisone. Um, and when we do that and people can tolerate it, which is a key thing because about 50%, 50% of people can't tolerate cortisol just from different side effects. But when people can tolerate it, it can be a game changer for revitalizing that adrenal gland. The key there is it just takes time, usually a couple of years. It's not a quick fix. Um, and it really takes time to kind of allow that adrenal gland to rest, to heal, and then catch up with itself. And then the other component or part of that is if we, if we find that they have an elevated cortisol at night, which is maladaptive because we really should have a very low cortisol output, you know, starting around 9, 10 PM. What an elevated cortisol does, it blunts the uh, output of other anabolic hormones such as testosterone, growth hormone, even melatonin. And so those people end up not sleeping well. They don't have restful sleep. They wake up not refreshed and they get caught in that vicious cycle. Low cortisol in the morning, high cortisol at night. They're not healing. Their, their injuries catch up with them. Their workouts are not as intense. Their recovery becomes poor. Um, so for them, Sometimes you need to add things like testosterone growth hormone or, or growth hormone releasing peptides and melatonin. Um, and those are, you know, powerful, amazing tools for people to take part in for sure. You know, and I, I remember from my hormone testing, you know, obviously growing on it and doing everything that I was doing, um, you know, when I studied and looked at my own blood results from a hormone panel, the uh, sex hormone binding globulin, which is... Uh, related to cortisol and sex hormone binding globulin, I'm sure you can talk to, but it basically soaks up all of your free testosterone yeah. when that level is too high. So it's not that your body is necessarily incapable of producing testosterone, you're just incapable of utilizing it. Sure. And, yeah, and that it, can be a big problem. It can be a huge problem. Unfortunately, with that, sometimes it's genetically related. Um, there's a few things we can use. For example, you know, one surefire way I found to lower sex hormone binding globulin is actually to give people testosterone. And mm-hmm. so if you give people external te- or exogenous testosterone, 
you're able to lower the sex hormone binding globulin as well as elevate their free testosterone, which is probably the key component there, or the key marker, uh, because that's the, the testosterone that's freely available to bind to the receptors. Um, and when you do that, when you make that shift, as you're saying, you know, a lot of good people just feel so much better. Yeah, makes a makes a huge, huge fucking difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, no doubt about that. I wonder, you know, when uh, when we're talking about there's particular, you know, respiratory conditions are at the forefront of things right now. Um, we've all seen it in the movies, and I don't know too much about asthma, but as, you know, a general practitioner, I'm sure you have lots of patients with asthma. And it seems like in the movies, when people get really stressed, that's when they reach for their inhaler, right? Like yep, yep. super stressful situation, like, ah, I need my inhaler because their lungs are actually shutting down. What's, yep. what's, actually, what's actually happening with that asthma response there? I mean, I think it's a couple fold. I think, you know, part of it is going to be psychosomatic, right? So if people feel some anxiety. Um, it's going to rev up that kind of momentum within them that, oh my goodness, I can't breathe. Um, especially if they've ever not been able to breathe and people with asthma, that's common, right? It's that they don't, they have a, you know, a tough time exchanging oxygen and that becomes, you know, this big heaviness in their chest. They start to gasp because they, you know, it, it feeds on itself. And, you know, for some people who go through that, sometimes all they need to do, sometimes I've told this to patients is, yeah, go ahead and drive yourself to the hospital. Um, but then if you can, while you're sitting in the hospital parking lot, just focus on, you know, this, this may sound really silly, but it, it actually works. If you can distract the patient and get them to settle down from an anxiety perspective. So what I tell them to do is try to focus and make one of your hands, you know, more red than the other hand. Bring more blood flow to hmm. one hand than the other which by the way is possible, people wanna try it. <laughs> but if you get people to distract themselves by doing something like that, a lot of times that anxiety goes away and then they're back to breathing. And, and so a lot of it, I don't wanna say a lot, but, but some of it is certainly mental. But then there is mm -hmm. the physical and biochemical component to that um, where they do need to reach for that albuterol. And, and what seems to be happening physiologically is their airways which um, people probably read about because of the corona are these alveoli, um, which is kind of these, I think of them like balloons. And they're trying to open that balloon, right? That's how we inhale, fill up that balloon, exhale, and it kind of melts away. Well, when they're trying to do this, their balloons or their alveoli become more rigid. And so they become like a, if you ever tried blowing up a balloon that's really hard to blow up, you're really having to force right? A lot of pressure to do it becomes uncomfortable over time. You can't do it. So they reach for albuterol, um, which is a, a medicine that works quite well. What that does is it relaxes their airways, it relaxes their alveoli. So then they become like easy to, you know, blow up balloons. And that just yeah. times a couple puffs of that and they're, they're, they're breathing well again. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the physiology of it. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, f I have so much sympathy for people right now when, you know, the, the focus of corona symptoms are respiratory, like, and people have respiratory issues all the time, right? Like, and right. people get pneumonia, people get pneumonia every year, you know, sure. and people get bronchitis and people get all kinds of lung related conditions. I mean, if you're unlucky enough at this time to have bronchitis or pneumonia during this COVID um pandemic with that's so heightened by you know these kind of fears like holy shit how fucking scary is that you I know, know what i mean like at that point you're like i'm gonna die for sure you know sure. like like that thought's gonna go through your head as you're listening to you know the way that you know the media has been talking about this really being ignorant to the nocebo effect and really kind of tapping into people's fear like things that may not even be that are going to are going to trigger a massive massive response and i think that's you know something for people to be mindful of is that look there's a there's a bunch of people that are going to have respiratory conditions you know so be mindful get checked like do go through the steps but don't allow yourself to go down that to go down that road it's why everybody cautions against going to webmd because if you go down a webmd oh, symptom rabbit hole you you're definitely dead <laughs> you know like definitely it leads dead. it leads only to death you yeah. know when you start yeah. googling Sure. One thing we've uh, been doing recently, which seems to have a positive, you know, real physiologic benefit is, um, you know, we're giving people uh, glutathione that they can nebulize. 
So we use mm-hmm. a nebulizer and you take that glutathione, which we use intravenously, and you breathe it in. And that has a really nice antioxidant effect on the lungs directly. And that can be a That's really cool. nice, yeah, it can be a really nice bolster, um, whether you have asthma, uh, trouble breathing, or you know, even just have an upper respiratory infection. Um, inhaled glutathione is a really neat option for that. Hook me up, Doc. <laughs> of course, Hook I will. Me up. Up. Yeah. Hook me up, Doc. Yeah. That sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the treatments that I think is really emerging that we've both been exploring and exploring uh, the potential utilization of from a holistic standpoint is ketamine therapy. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the you know from your perspective, and I can talk from my perspective experientially. What do you see as the as the potential uh, now that ketamine is a, a legally approved um, you know, something that you can prescribe and offer to your patients? You know, what are you, what are you kind of seeing? I think ketamine could be a, a massive game changer. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's what we've seen over the last couple of years for people who are, you know, exploring its use. Um, <clears throat> you know, what we'll do, we, we use it several different ways. So we combine it when people are getting intravenous NAD and they're a good candidate, We'll give them intramuscular ketamine, um, which can provide a really nice, sometimes really profound, you know, kind of, uh, you know, inside journey for themselves where they can get some clarity, insight. Um, ketamine I has for it. sure, I for sure want to do that because NAD is like someone reached up <laughs> through my scrotum and yeah. grabbed my intestines, twisted, and is slowly pulling it out of my asshole. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what, a pretty that's good description. What NAD, yeah. That's what NAD <laughs> feels like. Yeah. But if I was on ketamine, I'd be like, ah, there's you a little hand. You wouldn't even feel it. Yeah, you don't even feel it. <laughs> there's you a little like, hand and yeah. it's in my asshole, but I don't <laughs> care. Right, like you don't, even, you don't even feel it. Like you're, you're somewhere else for 30 minutes. And, yeah. um, but it, there's a euphoric component to ketamine, especially intramuscular. People come out of that. They can feel like they can take a, a deep breath, maybe sometimes for the first time in a long time, and they feel really light. And then we can extend that, you know, outside of the office in, in different vehicles, whether it be a ketamine nasal spray or a rapid dissolve tab. And allow people to have a very interpersonal experience. Um, again, very, very safe. What's really nice about ketamine um, is there's there's really no downside, right? I mean, yes, it is um, something that people have to be mindful of that they could overuse, but there's you know safeguards there. Uh, but mm-hmm. but we've just found it to be a very good, you know, classically ketamine is a pattern disruptor. So if someone's having a panic attack or you know, depressive thoughts, chronic pain, um, you give someone ketamine and boom, very quickly you've shifted where their focus is and you've shifted in a positive way. Um, and then it, you know, it, there, it seems to last for most people several days. So one ketamine treatment um, can be way more powerful than an SSRI, <clears throat> something like Prozac. And then beyond that, um, taking it a step further, you know, even on the conscious level, people using ketamine, we call it like truth serum. And the, and the level of conversations that people can have and the meaning to those conversations seem to take on a different tone. And so mm. people are really excited about it. Um, again, very, very safe and for the right person. Um, I think it'd be a really, really, you know, inspiring tool. It has been for me. I mean, it's been one of my, one of my favorite tools in combining it with meditative practices. And really, you know, it brings you to this place, what Joe Dispenza would call the void which is a place of <clears throat> this kind of abundant, abundant blackness. You know, I do it with a blindfold. I yeah. do it with a meditative practice, either music or through some other form of breath work and meditation. And it'll bring you to this, this kind of pregnant void where from that place you can envision your future realities. You can look back and, and see elements of your life that were previously blocked because of fear or you can look at a relationship that's been really troubling you and see it from a different perspective or sometimes it really feels like you connect with the divine whatever your definition of that is you know it's just, it's a something that you feel but you can really connect with the universality of of everything of source yeah. and it's been really incredibly powerful to use in that ceremonial context. You know, I am someone that's suffered from bouts of depression in my life and certainly thrown myself into extraordinarily challenging relationship uh, conditions that have brought a lot of acute emotions and stressors. And, And being able to use that as a tool to help 
both when I'm, you know, feeling those depressive states or feeling these kind of challenges that I can't seem to work my way around, or I just want to envision a future reality where I'm healthier, where I'm happier, where I'm stronger, where I'm, you know, more spiritually connected. Um, it's just been an amazingly powerful tool. Yeah. And I think, you know, classically people say ketamine is sterile, but I, I don't think so. I mean, there's certainly, I think as people f get familiar with that spiritual, divine, celestial place, um, ketamine can play that role too, um, for sure. And, you know, I think the, the conversations I've had with lots and lots of patients who are utilizing ketamine are just like yours. Like it's a wonderful tool. And the reality is all of us go through bouts of depression. All of us go through bouts where we're super stressed out, have anxiety. That's part of the human condition. Um, and the goal isn't just to, you know, ignore that. Ketamine is a way to work through it. And I think it's a really yeah. healthy and positive way to work through some of those negative emotions for sure. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Well, if people want, I know that you, uh, you obviously are one man and this is a, a, a podcast with quite a big reach, but if people want support, you know, what is the best way for them, um, either to reach out to you to potentially, you know, potentially look at being a client or sure. also, I know you have an extensive network of different nurses that are providing the fast IV and the glutathione and NAD treatments. Um, you know, what's the best resource that they can point to? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they can go to our website. I mean, we have several avenues for them to reach out uh, to us, fill out forms, ask us questions. Um, and the website's coniverwellness.com. Pretty simple. Um, Conover with a K. Conover with a K. Conover with a K. Yep. Coniverwellness.com. Um, they can message us on Instagram, but usually the website's going to be the best way. And, uh, you know, we'll certainly get back to them. And, and we'd love to help as many people as possible. We know that. You know, we just have a different approach than most doctors, and, and we love being able to provide tools that are, you know, outside the box for people, tools that work, time-tested tools, as well as give people options. Um, it's really important that, I mean, everyone knows that there's tons and tons of positive options. You know, it's, it's we don't have to live in fear. We can certainly focus on feeling abundant, um, feeling curious. And for most of us, I mean, my experience, most patients just want to feel better, right? Beyond the diagnoses they've been given, they just want to feel better. And um, we've time tested lots of ways to help people, you know, bridge themselves to that place so that they can do that on their own. So, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that's beautiful. And I guess in, in final words for me, you know, like maintain as much positive, positive outlook as you possibly can. Be mindful of your fear, but don't be ignorant and ignore symptoms or things that there's sometimes things where you need help you know and, and none of this conversation is saying that it's all mental and there's never a situation where you don't need to go for help and you don't need to reach for your asthma inhaler you don't need to go get checked for covid like if you if you really need the help go get the help you know but and at the same time maintain the positive attitude because that's going to help the most so this is not a mutually exclusive no. thing the positive attitude and the willingness to go get help when you need help i think is the combination that's going to yield the best result for everybody yeah i think that's well said and i think one thing that this whole corona thing has highlighted um at least for me is the importance of having you know a physician per se that you feel comfortable talking to everything going on because having that support yeah especially when they come across from a positive framework is going to be super valuable, you know, cause we've gotten hit up from lots of people who are not my patients saying, Hey, during this time, we'd like the support and, and we'd love to help. It's just, you know, um, for people who have already taken the time to build that relationship, I, I think that's worth doing. You know, I think, and I think it's also yeah. worth doing trialings, lots of doctors. I mean, you, it doesn't mean we're way past the time where you had to go, and see your doctor just because he was, you know, on your street corner. Like we're well beyond that. And I think it's hard for people to get really positive, valuable medical advice, but it exists. And I encourage people to keep trying until they find a good fit. Well said, well said, brother. And I'm, you know, eternally grateful that I have you as that person in my life. And um, onward we yeah, go. With, you know, so thank you, th thank you for all your support to myself and and you know my family and closest friends and everybody that I've known and. Uh, the fit for service community that I know you've 
you know, come and, and enjoyed and, and offered your services to as well. And so just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so Brother much. Brother Feeling Mutual, Aubrey. It's, a, it's literally an honor and privilege to get to know you, work with you, um, and see, you know, just everything we can do together. Uh, you're, you're a great leader. You have an inspiring voice. Um, and it's just literally an honor uh, to be able to work with you. So thank you. You're welcome, brother. You're welcome. Thanks so much, man. And uh, I look forward to when we can get together again after all this craziness okay. ends. Absolutely. Awesome, Aubrey. Love you, buddy. So there's a few things that I keep in my medicine bag at all times. And I've been prone to having sore throats since I was a kid. Like I remember getting strep throat when I was younger. I remember getting all kinds of things happening where there'd be nasal drainage and my throat would be sore. Or when I've been an adult, just talking a bunch, doing a bunch of podcasts or anything, having a sore throat is like an issue or a scratchy throat or any kind of irritated throat. And I have not found a single better thing in my entire life to use than the Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray. Now Propolis is great for you to begin with, but it just works. Like nothing feels better for your throat. And that doesn't matter if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're just feeling that kind of irritation in your throat and you take a swig of water and then spray this in your throat or if you just want to clear out your voice so that you can perform in any way that you want there's literally nothing better than this so it just goes with me everywhere just in case I need it I know I want to have this in my medicine bag so it's simple you just open your mouth spray it in four times and it just soothes and coats the throat like, I don't know what the bees are doing, but they're making some magic shit. And I just really appreciate Beekeepers Naturals producing the highest quality products that they possibly can from the bees so that the bees can help support us. And then hopefully we stop fucking around with the Earth's environment and we can help those bees out too. So it becomes a symbiotic relationship, bees and us and bees. And we're not just stinging each other literally and metaphorically. So check it out. Go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash Aubrey, save 15%. And make sure you just have this in your medicine bag. It's clutch, it's crucial, and they got a bunch of other cool shit too. So beekeepersnaturals.com slash Aubrey. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to aubreymarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.